All right, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started so we can get everybody out of here uh, on time. So let, let me welcome everyone uh, to uh, our OSHA presentation. We are, I think everyone is in for a treat. Um, my name is Rob Remington. I am the chair of Honlosier and Parks Construction uh, Practice Group, and uh, we are thrilled to have the opportunity uh, to put this presentation on with, with our um, uh, labor and employment area and my partner, Steve Seasley, who's sitting in the back. Steve, give everybody a hand, but we're, uh, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to put this on. I think it's, it's an example of uh, the hot loader and parks way, which is we work together, we work across areas and practice groups, um, and we find efficient uh, and uh, value-added services by doing that uh, and collaborating and I think this is a good example of that. So since Steve gave me the opportunity to, to do the welcome, um, it gives me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the construction practice group. Um, and I think uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes um, to tell all of you a little bit about our construction practice group. Many of you know us, but many of you uh, are new to us. And so um, let me you know, start by telling you you know, one of the emerging mottos in our group is your business, your industry is our business. And we take that very seriously. We are now uh, over 20 uh, lawyers uh, from Cleveland to Florida, from Florida to San Diego, who focus their practice on the construction industry. Uh, and we are growing uh, and we continue to grow. We're very excited um, uh, that three uh, people in Cleveland at the end of 2017, um, many of you know Andy Vitale, premier uh, construction lawyer, uh, in, not only in the state of Ohio, but nationally. Uh, we're thrilled to have Andy. Um, Andy and I have known one another for 30 years. Um, we have been friends, we've been opponents. You know, I've said I've had a lot of choice names and titles for Andy over the years. But I will tell you, it's a privilege for us to be able to say that Andy is a colleague. Um, and he came into Han Lozier exactly as I would have expected and become an immediate mentor to everyone in our construction group, including me. Um, we are very fortunate with Andy to have Aaron Evanchek uh, over here. Um, Aaron is a rising star in every sense of the word. And I really see Aaron uh, as one of the really the future stars of our construction practice group. And then Shannon Marsh, who supports us all, and is a paralegal who joined us from Andy's team as well. And we are absolutely thrilled to have them. Uh, and it has made our group uh, incredibly strong uh, across all areas. So um, we're looking forward uh, to working with them in the future. OK, uh, let's go to today's presentation. Uh, an ounce of prevention uh, is worth a pound of cure. And I think that's what you're going to hear from Doug Suter and from Rob Pork today with respect to OSHA. Uh, and this is, this is a, a, a uh, I think, a presentation that we hope to start to give on a more regular basis because as the law changes, um, as the opportunities arise to educate people in your company with respect to these issues, now is the time to take advantage of it because now is the time everything you do to understand the potential issues with OSHA, um, the risks, liabilities, the way to prevent liability, uh, you know, is, is, is a huge um, savings uh, compared to what could happen on the other end. Um, Doug Suter will be our first speaker today. Doug is a partner uh, in our Columbus office. Uh, he has extensive experience in OSHA matters. He has tried over 300, uh, I've been involved in over 300 OSHA matters in his career, and he has handled hundreds of um, uh, injury, uh, serious injury and death cases uh, over the course of his career. Uh, he has also um, worked for industry organizations like the Builders Exchange uh, on nationwide projects, and we're fortunate to have Doug, he'll be our first speaker. And then Rob Ford uh, will finish up. And Rob is a partner in our Cleveland office, a member of our construction practice group. And Rob uh, has his master's degree in engineering, uh, served for 10 years uh, in the industry before going to the dark side and becoming a lawyer. 
Uh, and he's a great example of, I think, um, one of our members and one of our many members that has both a technical background uh, and industry experience that he brings to the work that he does with our group every single day. So you'll hear from Rob second, and uh, I know that during the course of this presentation, if any of you have questions, we would encourage you just to put your hand up and Rob and Doug will address them. But without any further ado, I'll introduce you to Doug Suter and we'll get started. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. As Rob indicated, my name's Doug Suter. I'm a partner in the, the Columbus office, but as Rob's indicated, we have offices all over the country and Typically in our litigation matters, we tag team everything. Rob Port, my partner who put together the slide presentation that you're gonna see. Rob and I tried a three week jury trial in Los Angeles Superior Court where OJ was tried. And Rob did some phenomenal things with the visual evidence. So um, we, we co collaborate as a, as a firm and a team and we work on labor employment and litigation matters uh, all over the country. Um, we're going to cover a lot of topics today, and we have an hour and a half to do it. Um, and I want to tell you the topics that we're going to cover and then kind of give you kind of the background of why we're covering these particular things. But uh, I noticed in the, in the sign-up sheets that we've got a lot of risk managers or, or safety directors or folks who have an interest in the, the topics today, uh, reducing your liability, reducing your OSHA exposure, reducing your civil liability. So we're going to cover all the things that as a lawyer I see when we have OSHA issues or workplace fatalities or serious injuries. Um, and to give you a little bit about my background, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. Uh, I started in 1988. I was in a, in a law firm with a very heavy trial emphasis. I've been a trial lawyer my whole life. In my very first OSHA case or experience, um, was in 1989 when I was asked two weeks before a jury trial was supposed to start to help with uh, the defense of a case where a construction superintendent was crushed by a piece of construction equipment while his entire crew watched him die. <clears throat> and the individual's name is, was Olin Double and it's a reported case that went to the High Supreme Court. And his very last words before he was crushed alive was, I know an old Indian trick. And the people that, that I tell this story to say it's equivalent to the guy who, before he does something really stupid, says, hold my beer. And what happened, this construction superintendent was standing between the wheels of a John Deere front end loader. And um, somebody had put lights on the top of the bar so they could use it at night. And in the process, they circumvented a safety device, which was designed so that the, the equipment would not start unless somebody was sitting in the seat. This guy was standing on the ground. He takes this big wrench and he's showing off to his crew. He hot wires it and because the, the safety device had been circumvented, the thing was in gear and it ran over him and crushed him alive. And so I was asked to come into the case. I knew nothing about OSHA, uh, but luckily for me, the OSHA compliance officer who had investigated the fatality had just left OSHA. And I contacted him and he got the leave to, to be a witness in our case. We resolved our issues at the trial, and this particular individual had just left OSHA and he said, you know, I'm learning, I, I'm, a, I'm an OSHA consultant now, nobody knows OSHA liability, would you come learn it with me, and would you represent my companies when we get cited by OSHA? So that's kind of how I got started. <clears throat> Four years into it, we were asked, uh, this individual and I, uh, to meet with the Builders Exchange of Central Ohio to help develop their safety program, which is... I think one of the preeminent safety programs for the construction industry. A couple years later, I defended the first criminal willful case brought by the Justice Department in Ohio after an employee fell 300 feet off a communications tower when the rigging failed. And so that was a real eye-opener to me as a litigator that, and we'll talk about some of this, that when you have workplace safety fatalities or even injuries, sometimes you're not just dealing with civil OSHA you're dealing with potentially criminal uh, penalties that can put uh, somebody in jail or prison. And we'll, we'll talk about those. Years later, 20 years later, fast forward, I worked with the Justice Department, the Cleveland Solicitor's Office, and the Columbus OSHA Office 
to actually secure criminal willful violations against a large company with 18 facilities in, in the country and management had disabled safety interlocks on the machine and the lady was crushed alive and after she died the company made it look like the, the uh, interlocks were working so um, so I've kind of been on both sides in my litigation practice I've defended employers in workplace safety matters and I've also represented uh, um, families of, of, of employees that have been killed or injured in workplace accidents so I have a pretty good feel for all of the things that, that you all deal with <clears throat> uh, in your particular line of work. I know we've got a lot of construction-based uh, companies here. Two years ago, I represented a company who had an employee over and mentor a young man with three kids die in a trench during a waterline reconstruction project and guided them through the OSHA issues, the workers' comp issues, the VSSR issues, the wrongful death issues, all those kinds of things. So here's kind of what we're going to cover today. And this is really an informal thing. So there's no particular format as to how we're going to do this. If any of you in the room have a question as we're going through this, hey, I've got this OSHA issue or I've got this workers' comp issue, we can stop, we can deal with the issue, we can get back on track, but I would really encourage any of you who have questions to just ask and we'll, we'll address the issue that you have. Quite possibly there are people in the room that have the same issues or questions that you have. So we're going to start out with employer duties under OSHA and we're going to look at multi overlapping duties of on-site employers and employers going into facilities to perform work. We're going to talk about overlapping OSHA responsibilities in the construction industry, whether it's owner, general contractor, subcontractor. We're going to talk about OSHA's multi-employer worksite enforcement policy, which is how does OSHA site in the event of workplace, ha workplace place hazards when you've got multiple employers on a particular worksite, and it could be a, a GC and it could be multiple subcontractors. Sometimes construction managers fall into that. <clears throat> We're going to talk again about criminal liability, criminal OSHA liability. What's the company's liability if somebody gets killed on your work site? What is your liability if you lie to OSHA or you, you, uh, you fudge training records or confined space policies? So we're going to cover that. OSHA Severe Violator Enforcement Program has been in effect for about six years. Walk you through that and how you can end up on that list and, and all of the ramifications to you if you end up on that list. We're going to talk about OSHA's national emphasis programs and regional uh, emphasis programs because a lot of the OSHA emphasis programs deal with a lot of the work that I, I believe you all do in this room, whether it's general industry or construction. Uh, it's not in the materials, but we're going to talk about what are the defenses to an OSHA citation, what are the defenses to what's, what's called a VSSR action, violation of a specific safety requirement through the Industrial Commission of Ohio. Uh, we're going to cover uh, your liability of an employer based on what your lead, um, lead persons or foreman or supervisors on the job know about a particular uh, employee hazard. Um, we're going to talk about the one of the programs that the Cleveland OSHA office has, it's called the Phone and Fax Program, which uh, Howard Eberts, the area director, put together and has been used in some trenching and excavation cases and also uh, fall, fall protection issues. Uh, and then we're going to talk about OSHA or Ohio liability, and Ralph's going to chime in. You know, what's your liability as an owner or general contractor? in Ohio if a subcontractor employee dies in the workplace and what actions or omissions or participation did the owner, the GC, or even a sub have that led to an injury or fatality to a subcontractor employee. We're going to talk specifically about your contract documents. If any of you are the risk managers who are responsible for putting together the construction contracts for dealing with the insurance issues, and we're going to talk about the aftermath of all those kinds of things. So again, we're going to cover a lot of materials, hopefully giving you a general overview of the things that I think or we think that you should know 
at least have an awareness of that relates to your work. Uh, talk, I want to talk a little bit about the materials, where I'll mention the materials. Uh, at the back, uh, in addition to the slides that you're going to see, and, and the slides are being are part of your materials, uh, there's two handouts. One's called Liability for the Safety Practitioners, and this is a, a, uh, a presentation that I made for the Safety Congress for the Industrial Commission. And it covers all aspects of liability for the safety professionals. Um, liability motion compliance officers, your outside safety consultants, criminal liability, uh, OSHA 11C employee retaliation claims. If an employee claims that they've been retaliated against <coughs> reporting a potential safety concern or being interviewed by OSHA, uh, and then some liability under Ohio law for um, supervisors in the workplace. The other one is called OSHA's Workplace Safety Update. And this is pretty much Ohio specific. Um, and I kind of use this as a running tally. Um, and I've listed most of the significant OSHA cases in the OSHA offices, Toledo, Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati in the last two or three years. Um, I've listed uh, for you all of the employment fatalities in the state of Ohio in the last year. Uh, talk about some of the uh, larger uh, citations and penalties from the OSHA offices. And then this particular document's got the uh, emphasis programs and the severe violator program. And we're going we're gonna, to uh, talk about all those things. But I want you to know those materials are there. If you're uh, teaching a safety class for your company, please feel free to use those as reference materials. Or any of the statistics or the stuff in there, please use them as, as it may help you. So with that, I think we're going to get started generally with what are our duties and obligations to our employees and other employees under OSHA. So in your materials, we put together some examples of OSHA regulations that impose liability both on the on-site employer and the contracting employer, both in general industry and in construction. Specific OSHA regulations telling you these are the things you need to do to protect the employees that are coming into your facility to do work. And it could be a manufacturing facility. And um, we're gonna start off with an example of confined space. <laughs> this is the construction industry safety regulation under OSHA for confined, permit required confined spaces. And Basically, the OSHA regs, and we're paraphrasing, require that if you're the host employer and you know of particular areas or confined spaces in the facility that a contractor and a contractor's employees are going to be exposed to when they're coming into your facility to do work, it is your duty as the host employer to provide that specific information to the the contractors coming into the facility that are going to be in that confined space. And it covers all of the environmental conditions, the safety precautions, the PPE, all the things that that you as the host employer know that your contract employer and employees need to know. And typically, in the presentations that I do, I like to give real world examples of how these regulations, if they if there's a breakdown in them, leads to an employee injury or death. And I'll tell you that any of the scenarios that I, I talk about today, they're all public record. They've all been court cases or OSHA cases. So I want you to know that we don't reveal client uh, confidences and information, but just generally in the, in the scope of the presentation, give you an overview of um, how a failure or breakdown, for example, in confined space permit program can lead to injuries. And one of the most gruesome cases I ever had was back in the early 2000s, I represented uh, Safeway scaffolding. They used to be Tyson Preps Safeway, now I think they're back to Safeway. 
And Safeway, as you know, is a national scaffolding company and you know, big construction projects or, or uh, manufacturing when they do uh, the work, you know, the, the, the breaks to go in and do the maintenance work or construction work. Safeway would come in and set up the scaffolding. <clears throat> And this was in July, I believe it was 2002 or 2003, and Safeway had a job at the uh, Environmental Waste Incinerator in East Liverpool. And basically, that, that's what this facility is in East Liverpool. They burn hazardous waste, and the ash would form into these hoppers. And during this, this construction outage, uh, Safeway's job was to go in and put up the scaffolding so the boiler makers could go in and they could fix all the pipes in the facility in the in the burners basically and so their job was not to deal with the ash or any of these kinds of things the the ash in one of these hoppers during this outage the the temperature of the ash was typically 12 to 1600 degrees and if you can think about when you cook on your charcoal grill and you know all of the the charcoal is burnt you see the flames emulating um, but what happened in this particular case, the water, excuse me, the water from the pipes had leaked down onto the, the hot ash. And if you've ever been in a restaurant where they, they serve creme brulee, it formed like this hard crust. So underneath this material, the ash was like 12 to 1600 degrees, but you could actually go in and walk on this stuff. So the facility owners couldn't get the ash to come through the bottom of a hopper. So they tell the Safeway guys, hey, you're gonna be in there with fall protection. Can you guys go in there and knock this stuff down with your hammers and picks, and that'll loosen it up, and then hopefully it'll fall through the hole. And when you looked at the confined space permit, there was nothing on that confined space permit that would have led the Safeway guys to know, hey, this is a dangerous situation. When you looked at the atmospheric conditions on the confined space program, it's July, so they've got ambient inside temperatures like 95 degrees no notion of what this happened um, so the Safeway guys two guys go in there they're they're they got their their harnesses on they're picking this stuff and all of a sudden one of the guy's boots starts to melt and they're like get a board in here the my boots are melting and the superintendent thought they were kidding and sure enough the the, the, the crust gave way and this guy's hanging there on his lanyard and now the 1600 degree temperature that was the hot ash has now broke through and this guy basically gets roasted alive. And he lived and they, they life flight him to Pittsburgh Burn Center. He had eight skin graft surgeries, uh, but basically deformed for the rest of his life. OSHA came in, um, the facility owner said, hey, this was Safeway doing this work. And we got involved and said, hey, this was the facility owners confined space permit program. They had a duty to tell us as the contracting for, hey, what hazards are your employees exposed to? What precautions do they need to do? We get into the litigation and we find out that the, that the, the facility employees who had to deal with this hot ash, anytime they got anywhere near this stuff, they wore flame retarded clothing and the boots and the gloves, but these Safeway guys had no clue what was going on. And that's an example of this particular one. You have a duty as the host employer to make sure people coming into your facility know the hazards and know the precautions that they need to take if they're gonna work in your facility because it's your facility. <clears throat> Rob, let's go over to... Anybody ever have work operations where you're dealing with confined spaces? Any questions about how the confined space uh, regulations work for construction or general industry it's pretty much all the same general industry or construction you've got the responsibility even in construction if you're an owner of a project and you have particular knowledge under the new confined space permit for construction you need to communicate those to the GC's and the GC's need to communicate that to the subcontractor. Um, let's jump over to process safety management Process safety management. Anybody deal with work that involves process safety management? Um, not a lot, but let, let's, let's kind of walk through it because it's an example of 
specific OSHA requirements <coughs> for both, again, the host employer and the contract employers coming into the facility. And it's very similar to the confined space permit. There are very specific OSHA requirements in the process safety management regulations. And again, it's construction or general industry requiring um, communication, coordination between the host employer and the contract employer. And a lot of you go over to the, the duties of the host employer. <clears throat> Just put them all up there. One of the interesting things about the process safety management OSHA regulations is if you're a if you're a facility owner and you own a refinery where there could be pressurized piping or liquids or flammables or explosives, you have a duty before any work starts on your project to evaluate the safety programs of the contractor who's coming into your facility. So before work ever starts under OSHA, if you're the host employer, you have specific duties. I need to look at the contractor safety program. I need to know what training they provide the employees. I need to know what their safety history is. Um, one of the companies that Rob and I work for, a refinery company, uh, they have a company that basically goes out and they grade the safety programs of uh, contractors bidding on the work and they basically grade them whether they're acceptable, they got a good safety program, those kinds of things. But that's an obligation that you have specifically. The other obligation, much like in fine space, the process safety management is you need to communicate to the, the host or to the, the contract employer, here is our hot work permits, here's our line break permits, these are the processes we use, here's how we test to make sure you're not gonna open a pressurized line or a flammable line or those kinds of things. And there's a duty to make sure that the employees who are coming into the facility understand that. So that's a mutual obligation of the, of the facility owner and then the contractor coming in. Um, another example, Rob and I and Mike Pasco represent a company of a refinery. They were expanding their refinery. They brought in a a specialty contractor who had actually built one of these refineries before. They had an independent company look at the safety programs and they said this, this contractor knows what they're doing. They, they've got a good safety record. They bring the, the subcontractors in. This was their specialty. They had, during the course of an outage, capped off a line, a particular ventilation line for this refinery. And for whatever reason, we think that they didn't do it properly, but it was in their scope of work. A month later, the plant starts back up, and they had welders on the fourth floor of this large facility that was like 10 stories high, and they get a hot work permit so that the workers could do welding, and they made sure that whatever pipe they were going to do the welding on, it was safe, it had been purged, so there's no potential for explosion or hazards. So you got a group working on the fourth floor welding, and on the sixth floor, uh, this same morning, this was two, three years ago, the, the construction foreman said, hey, we got a bunch of guys with downtime, what can we do? And they said, let's go take that piece of pipe off that we had capped. And the foreman had been an experienced foreman, but he had only been with this job for three weeks. He had never done a line break permit and the company has a very specific line break permit that says before you open up any line in this facility, you gotta do atmospheric testing and you gotta do lockout tag out and, and 10 different things. This guy just initialed every one of them and hands it to the facility owner and says, hey, we did everything here. So fourth floor guys welding, two guys go and open this pipe and it was full of ethanol and it poured all over this guy and he had a non-intrinsically safe cell phone which means it wasn't spark proof and or it was the sparks from the first fourth floor but when that pipe opened this guy gets doused in ethanol and he burns alive explodes and believe it or not lives for a year or, or for a day rather so we dealt with the OSHA um, uh, investigation of our client participate in the OSHA investigation of, of the subcontractor client um, and the families made a $5 million demand against both companies for the loss. But that, again, is a breakdown of process safety management. 
there's protocols you have to follow, and if you don't do them, sometimes it, it could lead to injury or death. Lockout tagout. If anybody deals with lockout tagout? There is a duty under the lockout tagout, 1910-147. If you have somebody coming into your facility, you need to communicate with the company coming in what is the respective lockout tagout procedure or protocol that's going to be followed before the contractor employees perform their work. Years ago, I represented a company out of southern Ohio, and they made what's called environmental rooms. So if you were a testing lab or a chemical lab, and you wanted a, a room where you could adjust the heat from below zero to 120 degrees or adjust the humidity, that's what they did. And they had one of these environmental rooms at the Helene Curtis facility in Chicago, and that's where Helene Curtis would test hairspray and all these various things. And they had a simple like motor that went out. So they, they dispatched a service tech a couple days before Christmas. Mom calls the company and says, hey, my son never came home. And they go into the facility and found out he was laying over the machine electrocuted. And what had happened was um, on-site employer, Colleen Curtis, contractor, didn't coordinate the lockout tagout. And here there was there were shutoffs in the room where the employee got electrocuted but he didn't test it after he turned the power off. But it turns out that the power to the machine was in another room. So had they communicated the lockout tagout procedures, they would have known where this machine got de-energized from and the accident would have happened. So again, a breakdown in communications, a breakdown in the respective duties of both on-site employers and employers coming into the facility can often cause these kinds of unfortunate Let's jump over, Rob, to OSHA multi-employer enforcement. <coughs> Aside from specific OSHA regulations, OSHA's got the multi-employer enforcement directive, and it's been in place since about 1999. And even if you don't have a specific OSHA regulation that imposes duties on you, under OSHA's broad-based enforcement directive, you can be responsible for um, OSHA violations on a multi-employer worksite. Now, it applies to both general industry and construction, but by and, far, by and large, this is most often enforced in construction scenarios. And you've got four types of employers. You've got the creating employer, you've got the exposing employer, You've got the correcting employer, and you've got the controlling employer. And on a multi-employer worksite, there can be, can be, you can fit into more than one of these categories, but you can be liable for uh, exposure to employees of other contractors on the job. So let's just go real briefly through the, the scenarios. Um, the creating employer is the employer that creates the hazardous condition. You got fall protection in place, and another contractor comes comes by to store material and they don't put the fall protection back up. That employer is the creating employer because they created the hazard and exposure not only potentially to their employees but to employees of others on the multi-employer work site. Very common in construction. Roofing projects, those kinds of things. I've had numbers of cases where roofing contractor puts a fall protection in place on Friday. Monday morning somebody delivers the material. They move the guard railing systems or stanchions, and then OSHA shows up and they see the guys walking up on the roof and fall protection is not there. It's pretty common. <clears throat> um, what's the next one? Yeah, con controlling employer. This is kind of the end all be all. If you're a general contractor, how many general contractors do we have, or how many people do we have who employ subcontractors? Okay, almost all of you. <clears throat> Under the multi employer worksite provisions, OSHA holds you responsible, I'm going to use this, the word babysit, and I don't mean it disparagingly, but your job as the general contractor on a job is to babysit. You have a duty to police the work activities of every subcontractor on your job. And OSHA has a reasonable diligence standard, and if you're all sophisticated, this is a, this is a, a lot of the reasons why on big jobs where companies are bidding for work, 
that there's so much scrutiny placed on the subcontractors' EMR ratings and the workers' comp ratings and their OSHA histories and whether they've had accidents. Because what OSHA says is, if you're a GC and you have an established relationship with a subcontractor and you know their safety policies and you've worked with them before, your duty to police their activities is much, much less than if you're working with subcontractors that you don't have an established relationship with, you don't know anything about the safety program, they've had a bunch of OSHA violations or they've had accidents. So uh, it's real important if you're a GC that, that you, again, this is pre-job, you scrutinize the, the work activity or the, 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 the safety history of your subs but then on the job site, you have a duty to do reasonable diligence. Construction sites change every 10 minutes, as you all know, but you do have a duty to monitor to make sure that your subcontractors are enforcing the safety rules and, and ensuring that the subcontractor employees for whatever whatever subcontractors are on that job are not being exposed to potential hazards. Next one. Correcting the employer. This is probably one you don't see a lot, but on a lot, a lot of times on really big jobs, there will be a company whose, whose job is to basically go through a multi-employer construction site and be the one correcting fall protection issues or barricades or those kinds of things. So in the event that there's an employee exposed to a hazard and there's a company or an employer whose job was specifically to go through the job site to fix or abate potential hazards, that particular company could also, or employer, could be cited under a multi-employer. Exposed employees, employers, those are the employers who on a multi-employer uh, project, their employees are exposed to a hazard. And you could be cited as the exposing employer even if you didn't create the hazard. So in our scenario, let's say you've got an elevator shaft opening and somebody's moved the barricade, you didn't remove the barricade, but your employees are working close enough to be exposed to falling down the elevator shaft or the fall protection. When you're on a roof, somebody's moved the fall protection. Your employees are working in an area where they're not protected. You, as the potential exposing employer, you didn't create that hazard, but you've got a responsibility to protect your employees from that by doing a number of things. Uh, contacting whoever uh, created the hazard, and you might not be able to do that, but certainly going to the the general contractor who has the control over all the subs on the job to remedy that, and most importantly, in the interim, protecting your employees from that potential exposure. So even if you don't create the hazard, if your employees are exposed and you know it, you've got a duty under multi-employer to protect your employees. So that's what exposure is. Does that mean all them? I'm sorry? Does that mean all the employees? No, don't. Yeah, oh yes, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Stop the work. The, the question was, do your duties as the exposing employer include preventing the, your employees from doing the work or stopping the work? And absolutely, um, that is what you would do. And a lot of the construction contracts, you've probably read, sometimes give subcontractors the right to basically say, we're not exposing our employees to an accident, and if we have an issue, we're going to stop that. There's no ramifications for us protecting against potential safety violations. <coughs> Criminal liability. There's three or four ways that uh, there can be criminal liability for workplace safety. And if you look at your materials, the liability for the safety practitioner, pages four to seven, I've outlined some of the cases and I've outlined some of the, uh, the statutes that Ross can have on the PowerPoint. But there's a number of ways to have criminal liability for workplace safety. The, the, the primary one is a criminal willful violation. If you're an employer, and you knowingly violate an applicable OSHA regulation, <coughs> and an employee dies, you can be liable for a criminal willful violation. <coughs> and under the statute, there can be corporate liability, 
and there can be individual liability. Um, the courts have said basically supervisors are not liable for criminal local <coughs> violations. So if you're the GM of General Motors and somebody gets killed in the facility because the guard's missing, you as the GM are not going to be responsible. But in my case, the power case we're talking about, if you're the president of a small company and you're actually out there working and directing the activity knowing that this is an OSHA violation, you can have individual criminal liability. The um, individual criminal liability for criminal willful violation is six months in prison. And there have been a number of cases where company owners have gone to, to uh, prison over uh, knowingly exposing employees to dangerous conditions that cause their death. Corporate liability is $500,000 for the corporation. Uh, in case example, my tower case, an employee fell 300 feet from a, a communications tower because the rigging had failed. Um, and at the time, even though it was industry practice that on those big communications towers, the employees would ride up and down the load lines, OSHA's prescribed method for going up and down a communications tower was climbing, literally. And the argument in the industry is if the employees get so fatigued from climbing, that's a bigger hazard than riding on the, the load line or the suspended line. Interestingly enough, 20 years later, that is now OSHA's prescribed way to go up and down a communications towers. As long as you have the, the, uh, um, the rigging equipment certified, that's how it's done now. But at the time, the, the, everybody in the industry knew it violated the OSHA regulations to do what was happening, and the, the owner was actually running the equipment the day that this accident happened. Um, so that's an example of you know, a violation of, a, of an OSHA regulation that results in criminal liability. Um, some of the more interesting ways that there are criminal liability, um, Robert, you got into it. False statements, representations, and certification. Um, there is a federal statute that says if you falsify or make false statements in any document um, or you uh, materially make false representations to any agency of the federal government, you can be liable for um, violation of federal law. And this applies whether you're a company owner it could apply to employees. Um, if OSHA asks you what happened in an, in an accident or a death, and you're an employee and you lie to OSHA and OSHA figures it out, you have criminal liability. The one that all the safety professionals um, in Ohio are aware of happened back in the, the, in the 90s, late 90s, and it happened down in Mason, Ohio. Uh, steel records were, were erecting a building. Guys, I think he was about 40. 40 feet up, whatever it was, he was he had a duty to be wearing fall protection. The guy falls 40 feet, he's lying on the ground dying, and the job superintendent puts a fall harness on him. So when OSHA shows up, they're like, hey, he must not have been tied off, but we, you know, he had his fall harness on, blah, blah, blah. Um, six months later, the, the superintendent, and the company owner knew it, the superintendent knew it, safety director knew it and they all tried to hide it. Six months later, the um, the superintendent who had put the fall harness on the guy just couldn't live with himself. So he went to the wife and fessed up and basically the Justice Department and the FBI got involved and these guys were all sent to the U.S. District Court in Cincinnati. Two of them got probation, two of them went to prison company got huge criminal penalties, but uh, and that's a pretty egregious case, but that happens. The case that I talked to you about where I was on the other side was a large manufacturing facility in Columbus, and they had hired in a lady to run a forklift in the afternoon. The next day, they asked her to clean this big press that pressed materials for the construction industry, and it had an interlock gate. And if you walk through the door, it shut the computer off. The problem was it took 20 minutes to reboot the system and everybody hated the fact it took so long. And so the first time the management disconnected all the safety interlocks and 
BWC came in and did a safety inspection. The insurance company came in and did an inspection. Their own in-house quality control guy uh, notified management, you have to have those interlocks hooked up. So they hooked them back up, and then what they did to, to circumvent it is they started putting styrofoam over the electric eyes. So yeah, technically the interlocks were wired up, but by sticking the styrofoam over the, the, the eye, electronic eyes, you could open the door and it wouldn't shut the machine down. They tell this lady to go in, she had no safety training, she came from a temp agency. They said, go clean those pieces of styrofoam off the floor. She bends over and what OSHA thinks happened was when they opened the interlock, it cycled the machine to run. And so she bent over this machine, it's like 6,000 pounds of force, and it crushes her alive and 50 people are standing there watching her die. She dies alive and before the paramedics get her out, before OSHA gets there, the management people were in there peeling the styrofoam off the electric eyes so that when OSHA showed up, it looked like they had been. But every time you do that, you know, you run the risk that some employee is going to, you know, tell OSHA, you know, in our case, we basically filed suit and the quality control guy that had been fired calls and says, hey, I, I told management about that six months before and you can't do that. So inevitably, in any of these cases, and if you look at the materials, there's all kinds of cases where somebody dies in a confined space and some employer then backdates a confined space policy that never existed or permit that never existed training records where um, OSHA comes in and the employer says we train these employees, they fabricate training records and then the employees all tell OSHA we never had any of this training. Those are the kind of instances where it doesn't matter, you could be an employee, you could be a receptionist, president of the company, you have criminal liability and it happens all the time. Um, back in December 17th of 2015, uh, the Justice Department and the Department of Labor entered into a memorandum of understanding um, kind of streamlining the protocols that the government's going to use when there's workplace accidents or fatalities. And it's kind of a beefed up way that, that they're going to try and, to, and prosecute more companies for workplace safety violations. And this had always been part of the OSHA criteria if you look at the OSHA field operations manual, which is kind of the guideline that compliance officers use, anytime there's a fatality, uh, early on the area director is supposed to decide whether or not this potentially warrants criminal prosecution. And then in that instance, they take the compliance officers who have had criminal uh, investigation training, assign them, and they start building the case from the get-go to build a case for criminal prosecution, which is what happened in my tower case. They fell within that criteria because they had had a death before. Uh, but this new policy came about because of the upper big branch mining fatality down in West Virginia where all those people died in the mine. And there were clearly, no matter what the mine company says, violations of the MSHA rules. And at the end of the day, the Don Blankenship, the CEO, I think he got one misdemeanor conviction out of all those things and it was an embarrassment to the government and they decided we're going to start making examples of people. So if you have a workplace fatality on a work site, <coughs> keep in mind that you might not just be dealing with criminal OSHA, but you could be dealing with you know, uh, the Justice Department looking into what led to that particular accident. <coughs> yes? When you have a situation like that, I assume you, you call in criminal counsel. Do you have somebody on in your office that you work with, and, and how do you manage that? So well, you still do what you need to do and protect the, the people that are subject. I have typically done that um, because I've had the criminal prosecution. Uh, but in any case that we have uh, with a fatality, typically I'm as soon as I get notified, I'm at the scene. I want to find out what's going on. I want to interview management. I want to interview the employees. In any in any OSHA interview of anybody who has the title of even lead person, supervisor, superintendent, you're entitled to have a lawyer present for OSHA's interview. If you are a rank and file employee um, under the OSHA uh, regs, the lawyer's not allowed to be there. Now, the, the, the employees could have their own criminal lawyers to do that, but the company lawyer can't participate in that. But I've had situations. Um, 
I mentioned the Trump's fatality up in Metro a couple years ago. The facts weren't adding up, and I, I, I think everybody had a concern that maybe these guys weren't telling the whole truth. Sat them down and just told them what I just told the audience. Here's your liability. Here's what the statutes say. And if you want to get your own lawyer, you can, but I want you to know what the potential <coughs> liability is. But you see, again, you see more criminal liability from that stuff than you do from the criminal willful OSHA cases where somebody um, dies and then they, they go after the company because that kind of stuff goes on all the time. Any other question about criminal liability? Bribery. It's illegal to bribe a, a federal government official. It's, um, it's a crime to try to bribe an OSHA compliance officer. There's, there's an example in our materials general contractor is building a car dealership, OSHA shows up, they get cited by OSHA, OSHA does a follow-up inspection, we still have safety deficiencies, the GC tries to bribe the compliance officer not to write the citations, the compliance officer goes back to the area director and says this is what this guy tried to do, they set up a meeting and somebody wears a wire and basically the guy got convicted for trying to bribe the OSHA compliance officer, so don't do that. We're going to skip off of the um, going to skip off of the slides for a minute, and I want to talk about the uh, emphasis programs. And those are contained. <coughs> those are contained in the in the materials. You don't have to look at them right now. OSHA workplace safety update, page eleven and twelve. And historically, OSHA always has national emphasis programs and local emphasis programs. And they are designed, the, the way that the, the, the emphasis programs come along, the NIOSH, OSHA, Bureau of Labor Statistics um, periodically determine what are the highest incident of employee injuries or fatalities what standard industrial classifications should be solid, what, what industries, and what programs can we put together to um, have OSHA go out and look for companies whose work activity falls within these particular categories. Uh, to give you an example, some of the current national emphasis programs, combustible dust, hazardous machinery, Potential amputation injuries in general industry, manufacturing plants, um, process safety management we talked about, trenching and excavation. Uh, for all of you who are trenchers and excavating companies, as you know, in the event of a trench collapse, probably 95% of somebody in a trench collapse dies. So in OSHA's eyes, that is a high hazard industry. So for, it's literally since 1985, OSHA has had the National Emphasis Program on Trenching and Excavation. What's the significance to, to, of that to you if, you're, if, you, if you do excavation work, or sewer line work, those kinds of things? It's a little difficult unless you're in an off-site situation because OSHA uh, recognizes the plain view doctrine. A compliance officer can drive down the street, stop and look, and he sees an unguarded trench, he or she can cite you for it. But under these emphasis programs, uh, it creates what's called administrative probable cause. <coughs> if you own a manufacturing facility and somebody has an amputation in one part of the plant, that doesn't automatically justify OSHA going through your whole plant and going a wall to wall. But in these national emphasis program uh, programs, um, OSHA's position with the courts are, hey, we've identified that these particular industries, this particular work activity has a high incident rate of amputations or injuries, so that's our administrative probable cause to go through your entire facility and conduct a wall-to-wall. -wall. So um, if you fall within those, and look at those at some time, if your work activity falls within the <coughs> emphasis programs, uh, OSHA's required statistically to devote so much of their uh, inspections in a given year to those various hazards and emphasis programs. So if you fall within those even if you don't have an injury, you don't have a complaint, there's always the possibility that OSHA could pop up and say, hey, 
you fall within one of the industries in our in our emphasis programs, and we're entitled to conduct an inspection of you. Um, I included uh, some of the Region Five local emphasis programs. Sometimes they're national emphasis programs. Sometimes they're regional, and I've listed a lot of the um, the regional ones, which would cover any of the work activity here in Ohio. Grain handling facilities are big ones. I don't, I don't think anybody in the room does that. Um, but the most two of the most recent ones that cover both manufacturing and construction are lead and silica. And obviously, if any of you have dealt with the new silica regs, that's just starting to ramp up. But there, there are now two special emphasis programs requiring OSHA to look for potential lead exposure or silica exposure. Um, any questions about emphasis programs? How are we doing on time? Okay. Let's talk about OSHA's severe violator program. In 2010, <coughs> OSHA created the severe violator enforcement doctrine, and the the backdrop or the impetus for that particular program was that there are a lot of employers whose OSHA history suggests that they're not taking OSHA seriously. So we're going to create an enforcement mechanism to basically focus on the bad actors. And if, in fact, you end up on the severe violator list, there are significant ramifications. Um, the interesting thing for those of you in the construction industry is you may not be a bad actor, but if by virtue of the work that you do, obviously construction workers always fall hazards, trenching and excavation, there's always hazards. Uh, you can, in a particular situation, if you get uh, in a fatality, a willful or a failure to abate, what's the next one, Rob? That's high emphasis hazards, two willful violations or failure to abate notices, that also includes repeat violations. If you get two or more repeat violations, you can end up on OSHA severe violator list. So let's give you an example. Um, general contractor, we got hit for a fall protection violation two years ago, guardrail went down, or employee not wearing a safety device. Within a three year period, and again, it could be inadvertent, it could be a training issue, we trained the employees, they weren't wearing their fall protection, somebody took the fall protection down. Since fall hazards are the high emphasis ones, if two years later you get a repeat violation, two or more repeat violations, which is very easy to do, if you've ever been cited for fall protection violations or trenching, they always find a primary violation, a training violation, you know, they, they basically multiple ways. But if you get, get two um, repeat violations within uh, that period, you're going to end up on OSHA's severe violator list. And if you end up on OSHA's severe violator list, first of all, the, the penalty structure is such that you always get hit with the highest gravity penalties. The most important thing, whether you're general industry or construction, is if you end up on the list, OSHA has to inspect every work site that you have. So if you're a, if you're a general contractor and you've got four construction sites going on or ten construction sites, and OSHA puts you on that list, OSHA's going to show up at every one of your uh, construction sites if they're still open. If you're a manufacturing facility, you have 15 facilities uh, in the country, and you end up on the, the severe violator list, OSHA's got to go to every one of your facilities and conduct inspections. And that includes states that have OSHA state plan states. Um, the significant thing, is there any manufacturers in the room? for manufacturers, which is almost as tough as construction, is if you get a, a lockout tagout violation on a plant in Columbus, and then you end up getting a repeat violation, the same exact violation in a plant in Texas, that's a repeat, and you're going to end up on the severe violator list. Um, currently, the list is published. If you go to the OSHA website, they publish this particular list. There's 29 Ohio companies on the severe violator list right now very difficult to get off. Um, in the materials, one of the presentations of materials from iBio, 
I represented a company called Molly uh, Engine Components USA. Molly's the big company that makes all the engine parts for cars worldwide. And they had gotten hit with a lead violation. And a year later, OSHA comes into the Collinsville, Ohio facility, found wipe samples with lead, they put them on the severe violator list. And we actually tried the case and won the entire case because of the ramifications, because Molly has like 20 facilities in the country. And we basically, because we won the case, forced the director of enforcement to take Molly off of that list. Um, but if you get on that list, um, you're on that list for three years after you've abated the, uh, the last hazard that got you on the list, or you can try and settle with OSHA. And one of the things that OSHA does, they call it enhanced uh, enforcement. They may say, hey, if you hire a particular safety uh, consultant that we like with expertise in whatever your field is, and you agree to use that consultant for three years, and you agree to, to give his report, his or her reports to OSHA, and you agree to give us a list of every job site you're going to have for the next two years or whatever, we'll take you off the list or cut your OSHA penalty. But it's a real bear if you get on that list. And, and I know for a lot of contractors, we talked about the multi-employer. If you're a subcontractor bidding for jobs, and you're on that list, chances are you're not going to get too much work. So that's kind of the severe violator. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Hopefully nobody's on that list. Uh, the next topic is not in your materials, but it's very important. Where's our safety director? In the, in the room? Quite a bit, okay. The unforeseeable employee misconduct defense. This is your defense to an OSHA citation. It's your defense to an uh, employee fatality. What do you need to do as an employer to avail yourself of the unforeseeable employee misconduct defense. Number one, you have an obligation to assess the potential hazards that your employees are exposed to in their work activity. Obviously, if you're an excavator, it's trenching an excavation, you need to make sure that, that you take precautions uh, to make sure that any of your employees are exposed to uh, work in an excavation, um, have safety rules, they have training, you've got trench boxes, You've got hydraulic shoring. You've got to provide all the safety mechanisms for the type of exposure employees have. You have to have work rules um, specifically addressing those hazards your employees are exposed to. You have to train your employees uh, on the safety rules, the regulations, the requirements for whatever PPE or safety precautions they need to take. In the Sixth Circuit, where we all sit, the Federal Sixth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit requires that your training and documentation in your disciplinary doc documentation must be in writing. If you say, hey, I gave this guy a, a verbal warning, that's not going to cut it. So you need, you need documentation of your training. Once your employees are trained, you have an obligation as the employer to inspect your work sites to make sure that all of the required protections are being in place, whether it's haul protection, uh, excavation. If you catch an employee exposed to a dangerous condition, you've got a duty to to remove that employee from that dangerous condition, you have a duty to discipline the employee. So if you do all those things and you have an unforeseen incident where some employee is not supposed to be in the trench and was told to get out or move it to the next work site, the employee goes back in the trench and dies, if you prove all those things, we had these policies, we had hydraulic shoring in place, uh, this employee was trained in instances where we, we caught employees violating the excavation rules, we disciplined them, in that scenario, you probably meet the defense of unforeseeable employee misconduct, and you as the employer probably walk away from the OSHA violation. Anybody know what a violation of a specific safety requirement is? Okay. In Ohio, let's let's use an example of you have an employee killed on a, on a work site. In addition to OSHA, Ohio has its own specific safety regulations. And for the most part, they mirror OSHA's general industry and construction regulations, but not exactly. But if you had an employee killed in the workplace under workers' compensation death benefits, they get the, the family, <coughs> the, the, the dependents get two-thirds of that decedent's average weekly wages. 
for a VSSR penalty, the state, the BWC, uses the maximum weekly wage that anybody in a given year could make. And the way it works is if you're if you're the spouse, your employee gets killed, and, and you allege that the employee died because the employer violated one of the specific safety work regulations. Working six feet above a walking working surface with no fall protection, working in a trench, you know, over five feet with no trench protection, then there can be an additional award given to the family through the industrial commission. And the hearing officers have the discretion <coughs> of awarding 15 to 50% of that number. So you got a 25 year old employee with a 25 year old spouse, she's gonna get workers, she's gonna be workers comp, comp death benefits for probably age 75. That's a huge number. And if you get hit, it's 50% of that number. And no insurance for it comes out of the company pocket. Ohio has a very similar defense called the unilateral employee negligence defense. And it's almost the same thing. You train your employee, you provide the safety devices, your or PPE, your employees disregard your safety rules, don't use the, the protective devices that you give them, and they get injured or killed. You have the same defense as you do to OSHA. Hey, we met all of these various things, we did everything, we complied with the, with the state safety rules, the employees disregarded them. That employee and that employee's family are not entitled to get a penalty from us. So that kind of underscores the, the necessity for a good and effective safety program, because they're not only protecting from OSHA, protecting from civil liability and VSSR liability. John? When it comes to those issues, though, how, how important is it for the employer? Obviously, that, that, that makes sense when, you, when it happens more than time. But what about recurring time? In other words, there, there's evidence that it's commonly being disregarded even though they're not in <coughs> Well, the interesting thing, and in, in Rob's question is, what if you do, if you don't have an isolated incident, but there's a pattern that the employer doesn't follow OSHA regulations uh, or get cited by OSHA. The Ohio Supreme Court has said in VSSR cases, the hearing officers can rely on the federal OSHA citations in determining what the penalty amount is. So if you got a bad safety history, some employee gets killed on your job site, OSHA cites you with 15 citations related to that, the hearing officer can look and say, this, they're a bad actor, I'm gonna give them the full 50%. Supreme Court said they have, the, they have the, the discretion to do that. The other thing that the Ohio Supreme Court has said is OSHA, OSHA investigations, OSHA findings, OSHA files may be used by the Industrial Commission to determine the facts surrounding the accident. So if you have a trench collapse, OSHA comes in and they measure the trench and it's six and a half feet deep, the Industrial Commission's allowed to rely on OSHA's measurement to use it against the employer in the VSSR case. So it's really important in significant accident or injury cases to challenge the OSHA citations because you get you get an, you get the opportunity to work with the OSHA case because you know it's going to have an outcome on potentially VSSR claim or wrongful death claim. So that's that's kind of the thing. All these things kind of interact. If you have that's kind of how my practice developed, is kind of being like the quarterback of these things. You have a fatality, you've got civil OSHA, sometimes you have state investigators, because in the VSSR claims, now they send the, the VSSR investigators out immediately like OSHA. Potential criminal liability, OSHA liability, workers' comp issues, workers' comp liability, wrongful death actions, um, potential product liability actions, and in almost every state, OSHA, findings, investigations, facts are admissible in some form as evidence in all those things. So when you have a fatality, you have an accident, all these various things, whether you realize it or not, they're, they're all part of it, they're all connected, and how you deal with one part affects with how um, the outcome may be in another. How are we doing? I'm going to talk to you very briefly because you're all from the, I, I take you're all from Northeastern Ohio. <clears throat> a lot of excavators or GCs that do looping. One of the, um, one of the programs that Howard Ebert, who's the Cleveland Area Director, came up with a couple of years ago, which he advocates, and if you ever get hit by OSHA, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have him um, advocate for this particular thing. But Howie and 
Patrick Case, who's the OSHA uh, counsel for the solicitor's office, came up with this phone and fax program. And I had a case a couple years ago where a large roofing company that Andrew actually also represents, um, in the construction season, they have 80, 90 construction roofing jobs going on in any given time, as you can imagine. You know, a lot of activity, hard for the safety directors to monitor all those particular jobs. And one of the things that we find is when the construction business is really booming, it's hard to get safety trained employee out of the union hall. And sometimes the unions would send employees who had absolutely no fall protection training. But in any event, so one of these roofing contractors who I've represented for, for years ended up with a repeat violation in Cleveland and a repeat violation in Columbus. And so one of the guests who was supposed to be here today, Michelle DeVolso, one of the senior solicitors, I asked her if we couldn't have a sit down meeting. So Howie Eberts and Michelle DeVolso and Dave Wilson from the Columbus office sat down and we looked at the cases, we looked at what the issues were, and OSHA agreed to vacate the willfuls or the repeats and make them serious so that my client didn't get on the severe violator list. And in, in, in exchange for that, our client agreed to do this pilot program that Howard came up with. And basically, how it works, and, and um, they use it in excavation and they use it for fall hazards. But if you've got a, let's say, let's use my example, you're a roofing contractor. Every morning before any employee is allowed to perform work, roofing work, the job foreman has to take a, a picture on his or her cell phone and send it to the safety director. So the safety director can see that all of the fall protection is in place. And so no employee is allowed to do work until that safety director sees, okay, all the fall protection is in place. And then there's an auditing program in it uh, that basically every week the company had to do five spot audits. So in our case, the company's got 80, 90 jobs going on. Every week the safety director would send a text or an email to the job superintendent I want you to take a picture of the fall protection in place and you have five minutes to get it back to me so that the, the employees can't put the fall protection back in place before they send the picture. And that's kind of a self-auditing. And I think Audie's, um, Howie's mentality is just like a lot of you probably, you've got 80, 90 jobs going on. You've got one or two safety directors. You've got a job site superintendent and you know, a multi You can't cover all these. In his mind, that's an easy way to, to, to do this. You cell phone and use the technology that they have. And my roofing contractor likes the program. They then use the results in their periodic safety um, presentations or meetings. They'll, they'll look at examples where maybe it came back and the fall protection wasn't in the right place or those kinds of things. So if you ever get in front of the Cleveland OSHA area director and you fall within an industry that he's got this particular issue with, it's kind of his pet project or pilot project. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. And I'm sure he would ask you using that. <clears throat> All right, real quick, um, Ohio liability, Ohio's frequenter statute. In Ohio, if you're an owner, if you're a general contractor, and you hire a subcontractor to do work on your job site, the courts in Ohio say construction works inherently dangerous work. So the general rule is if you hire a subcontractor and one of their employees gets injured or killed, you as the owner or the GC have no legal liability for that death or that accident <coughs> because um, it's inherently dangerous work. Oftentimes you're hiring specialty contractors, plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians. It's their work. So you as a general contractor or an owner have the, the right to supervise the safety aspects of, of the work activity. And if you stop the work, that's not active participation. Where there can be potential liability for an owner or general contractor is if you fall within a couple of exceptions. If you actively participate in the work of the subcontractor, the subcontractor employees, or for whatever reason an employee gets injured or killed and OSHA believes they're an employee, not an independent contractor. I'll we'll talk about some significance of that. Um, there's one other one that's not on here. Active participation 
He directed the activity that resulted in the injury, gave or denied permission for the critical acts that led to injury. And number three, he had exclusive control over an, an instrumentality within the workplace. And the example that I've seen the most um, kind of litigated in a couple of these cases is the scenario on a, on a multi-employer construction site. The GC is the liaison or the contract person with the electrical utility. The general contractor is the one who schedules the work. The general contractor is the only one that can work with the electrical utility to de-energize the power lines or blanket the power lines, and they don't do it in a, a subcontractor employee gets electrocuted. Uh, in that scenario, the GC had exclusive instrumentality over a crucial element of the workplace. That GC could have scheduled the work activities, de-energized the power lines, blanketed them. In that scenario, an employee of a subcontractor dies, the GC's on the hook. That's an example of the exclusive instrumentality rule. <clears throat> Same thing with activity which injures, resulted in, in injury. You got a trench or an excavation project, subcontractor's doing the work, GC comes by and says, hey, we gotta get this water line connection hooked up in five minutes, and there's no trench box, there's no store, and if you're the GC telling that subcontractor employee to do that, and there's a trench collapse, the GC's on the hook. That's an example of, you're not responsible unless you actively participate in the work. I just wanna make one more point about with uh, these exceptions to the general rule of GC has no personal liability. Um, it's very consistent. So these, these, these exceptions are, are, are for Ohio, but as Doug said, um, in Ohio the courts have deemed that all construction sites are basically inherently dangerous activities. You gave a similar presentation in Alabama, and Alabama the courts do not hold that, and another exception to liability is for the GC is if they are doing what's called an inherent an intrinsically dangerous activity, then the GC has an added duty to provide a safe work zone. So the point is to be careful, know the jurisdiction you're in if you're doing work in, in different how many people here do work in other states in Ohio? Quite a bit. You know, under, and, and Rob's point's a good point, you know, under BWC, you often as an employer have the, the right to determine whether you're gonna, you know, if you got employees working in another state, whether you're gonna fall under Ohio's worker comp system or the state that your employees are working in. But it's really yeah. crucial if you have scenarios where your employees, or you have projects in other states, to know what the controlling law is in the states. Like Rob indicated, we've got an uh, inherently dangerous activity, um, and the only way the GC in Ohio is liable is active participation. We were asked by Owens Corning's general counsel to go down to Birmingham in December and make a presentation to their select contractors that use the material. Alabama law is totally different. Rob and I have cases out in Cali, out in South Dakota, where the law is totally different. You literally need to make sure, you know, if you have a construction contract, just don't assume that because it's some AIA contract that it covers all the particulars of your work activity. It really takes some advanced planning to figure out what's our potential liability, what's our workers' comp exposure, are there employer immunities under intentional tort, because all those things can affect you in the event that somebody gets killed. So it really is an advocation for pre planning. I think most states have a reciprocity on if you agree what state's going to uh, cover or have jurisdiction over the workers' comp and you're paying the premiums in it, uh, that that's okay. But you raise a good point, and that, that kind of leads to the last topic that we're going to talk about. It's going to be. Yeah, Andy. There is an issue in Ohio. If you look at Ohio's workers' comp statutes, if you're a GC and you meet, if you look at the statutes, there's like 15 criteria. If you meet like seven of them, in the event of a subcontractor employee death, the 
the subcontractor doesn't have workers' comp coverage, the BWC will treat that employee as an employee of the GC and not the employee of the subcontractor. And the things like Andy indicated, you're writing subcontractors' checks, you're giving the subcontractor employee a cell phone so that you can get a hold of them. You're not, you're not, you're, you're, you're directing their specific work activity, not a particular task. You have something to do with their hours of working. There can be, yeah, there can be an instance where BWC is going to say that that's not an independent contractor, that's your employee. So any of the indication of things when you don't have a separation of general contractor, subcontractor, you know, you should have an agreement that explains that they're an independent contractor or the sub is an independent company responsible for you know payroll, workers' comp, all those things. And it's kind of muddy in the event of a, of a fatality or injury. BWC is going to err on the side of getting coverage to that employee somehow. Right, and this is where we see it frequently. And it's a perfect example in the industry where no good deed goes unheard. You're trying to help, you're trying to get these people to cash, um, especially in the event where you've got kind of like the, the ball chasing yeah. and lack capital to fund. <clears throat> see that a lot in the construction industry with the smaller framing contractors and people coming along and you really have to take a hard line you've got to treat them this is a business and you've got liability and exposures and you have to you have to you know cross the T's and dot the I's in those scenarios. Yeah, so one of the the issue is when you're the union employer is how much control you have over the the, the individual doing the work or the work done. These factors, you know, up here, how much, you know, who controls what, the hours work, et cetera, or other factors about the method of payment, which was what Andy was talking about. It's a multi-factor test, it's case by case. But if they want to find, the BWC wants to find coverage for the person, then they'll take a couple factors and, and deem you as the GC, the employer. So it's all about, you know, the, the standard is, you know, the right to control or exercise of control over the, over the work means of the work or the work type. And it's a multi-factor test. In construction, um, this is sort of the common law test that were uh, you know, developed by the court. For construction sites, it's statutory. And, uh, there was about 20 factors. I gave you 10 out of the 20, and you could be deemed in, you know, all of a sudden, you're the employer now. And you're liable for, for vicarious liability for the conduct of the employee. You're liable for injuries that, that, that uh, they suffer. Um, you're liable for workers' comp. About I had a case of when the Supreme Court was that exact scenario. Home builder hires subcontractor, <coughs> loosey goosey, three guys in a truck kind of deal, and it's the day before New Year's Eve, and these guys are smoking weed and they're up on an icy roof, not using slide guards or fall protection. The guy slides off the roof, falls on his head, he's in a coma for two weeks and he dies. Looking at that control test, because <coughs> the home builder had given the subs off cell phones, and, and the BWC determined that that's one of the primary injury causes. Why would you give somebody a cell phone unless you're controlling their work schedule and when they're going to be on the job and all those kinds of things? So it's real important. And they had no real, you know, written contract or anything. What if you're doing a force plan and they're controlling your work? I've never had that issue. Have any of you? Yeah, I have, but it's um, just controlling in terms of direction where the work is going to take place and those types of things. It's usually done in an unambiguous procedure by the employer to pay for these things. And they do pay for them. The issue with that we see frequently is when people are just trying to help out, um, they're trying to prove a wage violation. 
it turns up, and I just wanted to cover one last issue really quick about um, indemnity agreements. Um, generally, they're enforceable. There's a couple requirements. You have to give prompt notice in order to have the indemnity enforceable. And in Ohio, uh, you cannot indemnify against your own liability in, in a construction site. But the, um, so the, the issue here, though, is with uh, workers' comp, because we're in, uh, in workers' comp, is an exclusive remedy. So if you're paying up the workers' comp and there's an accident, um, that the employee can get their payout for, through uh, BWC, but they can't come after you for liability. But, uh, so what happens is if you're the GC, you have a subcontractor working for you, their employee gets injured. So let's go through the scenario. So their employee gets injured, they get workers' comp, and they turn around and they sue you as the GC for failing to provide a safe workspace, or some other issue, maybe you took control over the work site, so now uh, you have certain duties. So you have an indemnity agreement with the sub, with the sub. So you say, okay, uh, subcontractor, indemnify me. And then they come back and say, no, workers' comp is our exclusive remedy. We don't have to indemnify you. And that would be correct. So the, the takeaway here, the, the important thing is to include in your indemnity an express waiver of the exclusive remedy through workers' comp. So here's um, sort of an example of a waiver where you have to, you know, expressly put in the language that the duty to defend is not limited by the immunity of workers' comp. Um, it's not limited by the uh, under the workers' comp laws, and you specifically waive at the bottom the immunity offered under the Ohio Constitution. So it's just important to just keep that point when you're going through your indemnity agreements that you could be out of luck if you don't. Sir, to your Pennsylvania question, I had this exact issue. Represented a company that, that worked on the fracking, and they would they would they would transport the, the, the byproduct of the fracking, and there was an, a huge explosion at one of these fracking sites over by Washington, PA. And the big Oklahoma company, one of those big uh, oil and gas companies, uh, got sued by our employee, but he didn't sue us because we didn't do anything wrong, and then because of the contracts, the big contractor tried to sue us for indemnity and contribution, but in Pennsylvania, much like Ohio, unless a Pennsylvania company expressly waives its workers' comp immunity, it makes those subrogation provisions unenforceable. So it underscores the reason that wherever you're working, you've got to understand the law. you got to understand workers' comp law, indemnity laws, contractual laws, because it can have, you know, in some states, that company would have been screwed. But so it underscores you need to know what what the immunity laws are and understand. Further on that issue, very briefly, as far as I was up there, uh, most people that are operating in Ohio, those clauses are not properly updated. Ohio is specifically requires you to identify that your specific work is not sanctioned and the provision of your Ohio Constitution in order to protect you from fraud. <coughs>
that's perfectly stated. I think we started this with an ounce of prevention, right? And, and I think you can see from this that you know, starting with just asking these questions, making sure your documents are right, making sure your employees are trained and understand the consequences of their actions, whether it's paying a subcontractor directly, maybe when you shouldn't, because all of a sudden you're creating liability, whether it's not having your documents in order, whether it's not knowing how to handle something uh, when an accident occurs. Something that you know, I think as Doug alluded to, um, might seem innocent at the time, uh, and later on, you realize, you know, has somebody actually attempted to cover something up and created uh, even worse, uh, you know, criminal, potential criminal liability. So um, we're at the end of our time. If any of you have questions, uh, people are going to be standing around. Always happy to talk to you uh, uh, by phone. Feel free to give us a call. A um, couple of quick things. Please fill out um, that, uh, uh, the survey if you can. Uh, we really would like to know how we can do this better. We'd like to know what other topics you'd like to hear. Um, and uh, if you would like the materials electronically, let us know. I want to finish by thanking our marketing group, uh, Aaron Hawk, who has our marketing director, who put this thing together really in one month for us. They did a tremendous job. Uh, and we thank them and we thank all of you uh, for um, being our clients. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. And uh, safe travels. And be patient with the valet. I know that that's probably the biggest frustration getting out of here. But thank you very much for attending.